Okay, so the reason why we're here today, the reason I called, asked you here, uh, your game, The Witness, is coming up, and it's on our like most anticipated uh, feature, part of that feature. But we, we don't know much about this game other yeah. than it's it's kind of like Mist. So what what is The Witness? Yeah, well, I've had to be very spoilery talking about it because it's a um, it's an exploration puzzle adventure kind of game, right? And uh, <laughs> We've, we've been in this interesting position where we're trying to be very open, you know, on our blog, talking about what we're making and what we're thinking about. We also don't want to spoil the game yeah. for anybody because the, the magic of the game is like what happens in your head when you're encountering a new situation and figuring out what's going on here and stuff. And so we've purposely not said that much about the gameplay. Um, I'll say some few, a few things. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is actually going to be it's going to be an interesting challenge as we roll toward release. And you know, we try to do a trailer. How do you do a trailer for this game without spoiling the game? I don't, I don't exactly know. Because the concept um, is, it's like it's a first-person, open-world-ish puzzle-solving adventure on some kind of abandoned island. Um, and that's that's kind yes, of yes, yes. So um, there's, it's very deliberately following in a certain history of certain kinds of games, right? So. Back when CD-ROM drives became a thing right, that people could have in their computers, right? You had games like Myst that took advantage of that yeah. and sort of blew up. And like Myst was huge, and lots of people played that. Um, and I actually, I really loved that game um, back when I played it. But you know, when I when I look at that, and then a whole bunch of games came after that, right? Trying to be like Myst. I mean, Myst was a whole series, but then if you walked into some computer store at that time, there would be like 15 games yeah. that were all trying to be missed, right? And usually not as well. Um, but then, uh, you know, as I look back at those games now as a designer with, you know, back then I wasn't a designer, right? I was just someone in college. And, and now I have ideas about how to design games. And, uh, you know, game designers as a whole have learned some things in the past 20 plus years. So as I look at that whole genre, with a modern design sensibility. I say, oh, that's wrong, and that's wrong, and that's wrong. There's all these things I wouldn't do if I was going to make an adventure game. So the question is, if you, so, so one of these ideas, one of these ideas we have as modern game designers is you have some idea about like what's the core gameplay of your game, like mm -hmm. what keeps it interesting. In a first person shooter, right, it's Often you might go into a mode where it's like seeing guys and aiming, right? Yeah. Or you might go into a mode where it's like, okay, now I'm looking for resources, and you're kind of flipping back and forth between those things. Actually, now it's like 50% <laughs> cutscenes, but you ignore that part. Um, and so that, like, if you're if you're making that game, you're aware that that's the. F you can always go back to that feeling or that mode that you want the player to be in, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's true for most modern kinds of games. Like for a racing game, you know what that's supposed to feel like when you're designing it, right? Um, adventure games, by, by which I mean the old style like puzzle solving adventures. Not, like sometimes Tomb Raider gets called adventure now or whatever, and that's not, that's not what I mean. Yeah. Um, those never had an idea of core gameplay. Like it's sort of supposed to be like you're figuring out puzzles, right? But if you actually look at what happens when people play those, most of the time, they're not really figuring out the actual puzzle that the designer wanted them to be thinking about. They're like, well, in the old style text adventures, it's like, does the parser understand this word? No, <laughs> why not? Err, right? Yeah. Um, and in later graphical adventures, it's like, hunt the pixel, or it's like, do I feed the sandwich to the seagull? No. Do I feed the sandwich to the dog? No. You know, like trying random things. Mm -hmm. um, and those aren't that interesting to me, and I think they're not really that interesting to most players. Those are like the bad parts of those games, right? Okay. And the good parts are when something really clicks in your head and, and you get a puzzle and you understand what's going on, which really can only happen when it's a good puzzle and when it's not surrounded by cruft, right? Okay. And so I what... Guess, I mean, just, just like looking at Braid, though? Yeah. Like, Braid was a lot of... Because there was no tutorial in any way, so you'd enter a new world and you'd figure out your powers, and so there was a lot of experimentation, and yes. though I guess it was ultimately always logical, it still was a lot of the equivalent of, do I feed the pelican the sandwich? Sort of. I mean, I, I would argue with you a bit there, because um, there's not 
So if I get a little programmery for a second. Okay. In adventure games, the way puzzles are implemented is with like if statements, right? You sort of say if this object and that object. So you're sort of saying arbitrary stuff as, yeah. as the person laying out the design logic. So in Braid, um, it's definitely the case where many of the puzzles in that game, more than half, have like exactly one solution. Mm -hmm. Some of them have multiple, but, but the, the multiple ones are different enough that some people only see one anyway. So it's a effectively one solution. <laughs> um, but all of those puzzles were designed a different way by making the sort of the physics of the world of like you go into that world and how does time work in that world? Mm -hmm. And then seeing what puzzles kind of naturally arise from that and then making those happen. So it's not like typing in a bunch of special case yeah. if statements, but it's like, let's see what happens in this dynamic. Now, I think that's a step better than the if statement thing I was talking about. Um, but in Braid though, yeah, like sometimes the puzzles are very hard. And even though they come out of a system for a particular world, people end up bashing their head against the wall sometimes and don't know what to do yeah. and start doing random things. So you get a little bit of a similar um, effect. Uh, so, and, and I don't, I don't know if I have an opinion on whether that's bad or good. Like, some of the reasons I think Braid is good is because the puzzles in that game are sometimes pretty hard. And, and then people work on them and, and get them and they make sense afterward. Uh, but uh, in The Witness, there's definitely much more of a spectrum. So there's, there's a bunch of puzzles in the game. Some of them, a lot of them, you can do in like 10 or 15 seconds. Like, they're not really hard. Uh, then there are ones that are hard that might take you like an hour to figure out. So there's that whole range. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'm trying to do is actually something I learned from Braid, right? So Braid had puzzles that were hard and it had puzzles that were easy. Um, but what was interesting was each puzzle had its own unique situation. It had something new to say, sort of. If you were really paying attention to the game, you could sort of understand the phenomenon about time that was happening in that puzzle very clearly and how that was different from the previous one and, and how that flows into the next one. And, and if you're not paying that much attention, I think it still kind of goes into the player's head. Like, you sort of feel something there. Uh, it just has a different flavor than the last puzzle and, and then the next puzzle, right? Um, so I'm trying to focus on that in The Witness and doing it at a much finer granularity. So, you know, we have over 500 puzzles in the game. Braid had like 60 or 70, okay. right? Um, and when you have that many puzzles, if each one of them takes an hour, that's insane, right? That's, there's no flow in that game, right? So we're trying to have flow, and this goes back to that idea of making a core gameplay that flows along. You have a flow of seeing a puzzle, understanding the idea, doing it, and that idea registers, and then you move to the next one. And so the puzzles become not difficulty challenges a lot of time, but flow of ideas. And because they're a flow of ideas, they're still interesting, even though they're not difficulty challenges. Okay. It's, that's maybe a little bit of an abstract statement, unless you, yeah. So, so um, you have a very, are you, like, your thought, your puzzles, like, the, in a linear way, the way that you would approach them in a, in a linear way as a player, do they, like, build on the thought processes and skills? Like, is, that, is this, like, a psychological evolution of puzzles as it, as it goes deeper and deeper. Is that how it Yeah, goes? I mean, the, so the game is building up in your mind as a player um, a very complex set of ideas of how to solve these puzzles. And none of it is verbal, right? I really yeah. don't like when games tell you, you know, stand on the block and push this other block and whatever. So um, the game never tells you anything about how to solve the puzzles, but it's all apparent, or at least enough of it is apparent to get traction and play through. Um, and then by the time you've played pretty far through this game, if you then go back and try to verbalize and explain what you know about the world and what you know about the puzzles, there's a couple of interesting things. First of all, it's a lot, and it's, it's sophisticated, but it's also, it's hard to explain at first because it wasn't given to you verbally. It was all through observation and playing. Mm -hmm. So you realize you don't know how to say the sentences <laughs> for a bit. Um, it's kind of fun, actually, talking to people, like asking them, like, so, so what is that puzzle about that you just solved? What did you do there? And they're like, well, um, um, and uh, we're really, because we're not doing these things um, 
because we're not introducing the puzzles with language, right? And then because each of them has its own idea and the ideas escalate, then oftentimes you can get into this really interesting space. It's like half logical, like I figured out this puzzle halfway because of, because I deduced some things about it. Like, okay, that can't be right because I know this and that can't be right. But then the rest of the way, maybe you just bridge it with intuition and you walk up and like you do it and you get it the first time and you're like, I 50% know why I got that, and I 50% don't. And then, and then people can reflect. It's just a really interesting space. Um, yeah, I don't know. Okay. So um, we talked about this when you were on a podcast with us yeah. like a couple of years ago. But one of the the only real like, was that really a couple of years ago? It was a couple of years ago. That is a while guy. ago. All right. So one of the only like glaring like this is obviously a problem in Braid was there's there's a puzzle early in the game where you have to like backtrack because you pass the level yeah, and you come back that, that and you was... have to reassemble pieces. So I don't, that was like a, that was a tough puzzle because it, it, it kind of ruined the flow of what you were going for otherwise. Well, what, like so, what have you, I don't know. I mean that puzzle is interesting because I, to this day, I don't know if it's the right thing or not. Okay. But I suspect if I were to make the game again, I would do that one thing differently. It's like the one, the yeah. one design, that's probably what we ended up saying, right? Yeah. It's like the one design thing I would have changed about Braid. Um, but I did that because at the time when I was doing it, I thought there was a problem that I needed to address. Yeah. Um, and it turns out that wasn't really a problem. So, yeah. It was, uh, I guess the problem you said was people were people stuck at every puzzle and didn't realize they could extremely completionist. Yeah. yeah. And I wanted, to, I wanted to communicate, hey, you know what? This is a game where you're sort of able to or supposed to be able to just pass stuff if you are not, you know. And in reality, not that many people have a problem with that. So. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, at the same time, though, to change that one part of Braid, I would have had to redo the whole world that it's in, and I don't really know. <laughs> it would have had to have gotten a little bigger, I think. Um, it's, a tough, it's a tough thing to think about. So, yeah. Yeah. So are there other types of puzzles or other developments, problems you've come up to that is like, you've gone a certain way with the witness and you've, and you've implemented something, and you're like, well, that is... That is way wrong, and it's kind of like the same mistake I'm making with Braid, or a different mistake. Well, you, you always learn from previous stuff that you do, right? Um, in The Witness, so for that kind of thing, right, we're not up to that part of development yet where I had that question about those, like that, when I was thinking about, should I change this or not, we still hadn't shipped the game, but we were like a month from shipping yeah. or something, which we're not quite at with The Witness. And, because The Witness is a bigger game, we're on a more compressed schedule. So the equivalent would be like a week and a half before shipping or something. Um, but there's definitely been many times areas in The Witness where I'll build out a whole area, you know, I'll maybe have some friends play test it, mm -hmm. um, and it'll be like an hour or two of gameplay, and we look at it and go like, yeah, I mean, it's all right, but it's not amazing, and... Or, or it doesn't quite fit the rest of the game, or it's, it's interesting, but it also has problems that kind of outweigh its interestingness. Like, I've had that several times, and then I just cut those areas and redo them. Okay. So that's, and that kind of process happened in Braid, too. So, um, but I, I do think that's very important. Um, you don't just, like, people, like early in your game development career, um, especially if you're a programmer, but, but it happens for everyone, like it's hard to get things done. It's a lot of work. So when you do something, you want that to be progress toward completion and you want to leave it in the game, right? Because, God, I worked for like a month on that thing. <laughs> and actually, sometimes it's better to not do that. So um, in, in The Witness now, some of our best areas are areas that were done and then scrapped like twice. And this is the third version, and now it's good, you know? Yeah. Or, or now, it was always good, sort of, but now it's like, lives up to what we want the game to be. Okay. And sometimes it took a long time to find those things. And yeah, that's why, that's why the game's not done. <laughs> yes. um, quality standards, very important. Okay. So yesterday, uh, changing topics a little bit. Yesterday, you acquired like you created a little mild Twitter stir. Um, yeah, I know. We, I mean, we got we got to talk about it. So all right, let's talk about so it. So you talked about how you played a lot of recently like highly acclaimed, kind of beloved games. 
yeah. that you thought were, were kind of the equivalent of dog food as opposed to like a, a chef, a well-made feast. Yes. Um, and, and it's not even so much... I, I mean, there's a little bit of like a snooty... We never see a chef, but it's like that's a snooty word, right? And maybe I could have thought of a better analogy, but sort of, sort of what I was trying to say is... You know, so, so if you play a game that uh, the buzz about it is like, oh, this game has an amazing story or yeah. it brings up really deep issues or whatever, right? Any of that stuff that I've been hearing about games lately, right? And then you go play it and you look at that game, well, if you apply the same kind of standards that you would to one of these games, that, that, that you would to like... Um, a novel that you're told has a good story. And not like a romance novel or, yeah. or something like that, but like, you know, I don't know, like pick your favorite author, <laughs> like J.D. Salinger or I, That someone. is my favorite author. All right. <laughs> Weirdly good enough. Guess. Yes. So it's like you pick something like that, and that's your idea of like a good story. And then you look at one of these games. I'm, I'm not going to name names right now, just because whenever I do that, the very quickly on the internet the story becomes that I say game blah sucks. And I really don't, um, I don't think that's interesting, but I do think the issue is kind of important. Like somehow, somehow people think that these games are doing something really smart or, or whatever. And you look at it and it's just absurd if you apply the same standards. And so we're somehow applying substandard standards to our own things as an industry and I, I, I don't feel like that's the way to really improve right um, and I don't on the other hand right <laughs> so obviously these games are getting some people excited yeah right and and there's not and there's good reason for that right so you play a game and at least it's trying to do a certain thing that uh, other games aren't even trying or aren't even touching, right? And that's a positive thing. Like, I, I like that. I think we all should be trying to do new stuff. But at the same time, I don't think you say, oh my god, this is an Oscar quality story, or, or this is, you know, what? like that's a little bit delusional. This, it, these games are just really bad story wise. Like, that's all I can say. So, so are you mostly upset with the storytelling method well, of certain crazy that's games? that's what I played this week, right? Okay. So usually I'm not that much of harping on story in games kind okay. of person because I actually it's not really my focus. Like when I think about game design you know like the witness has a story and braid has a story but the story was kind of you know one component among other things like five or six things all of which had equal stature so the story is like one-fifth of of the concern right okay. whereas some people go and design a game and it's like I, I actually didn't play heavy rain but for example <laughs> okay. that's a game that a lot of it is story right much more than than the things that I think about so um, that's not really what interests me about games. Um, wait, what was the question? <laughs> yeah, I well, I guess, I guess, do you have problems other than uh, story? Is this, is this? Well, I definitely do. Like, I'll play games that people are uh, saying is, are really great. And I'll, well, uh, yeah, I mean, one of these games that I played <laughs> had really fundamental gameplay problems. Like, it was making the same really absurd mistakes that games 20 years ago made and that we made fun of repeatedly and they're still doing it. And it's, yeah, it's just, I don't know. Well, I guess, to go it's, back to... So, so, and the reason, so, so let me just say, the reason, like, you know, I, I make a couple tweets on Twitter and people are like, why are you, why are you getting passively, aggressively <laughs> critical about all these other games? And it's like, it's like I really want games to be good, <laughs> and it it really bothers me sometimes. Like I don't okay, I don't exactly understand why it bothers me so much. So we'll start there. But um, part of it is maybe like I work I work really hard on my own stuff to make it hit some standard of like not making silly mistakes that we did 20 years ago, and like learning and pushing the idea of what a game is forward. And 
it's kind of like, well, if nobody in the world cares about that, like, what is that really worth doing? Like, I don't know. So maybe there's a bit of like, you know, identity threat there. Like, maybe I should just go make a first-person shooter or something. Um, uh, I don't know. So one of, one of the things that looked like you were you were talking about a little bit, or you were hinting at, was was kind of the critic's <clears throat> role in this, because you talked about how. These games are doing things that uh, are usually praised by critics, highly acclaimed things, and even those things are not doing well. Um, yeah. And then kind of just, just the idea of, you know, we're, we're pushing certain types of games, like the equivalent of a Transformers movie winning Best mm. Picture, and that's what critics kind of push with the gaming realm. So, I mean, what yeah. role do you think critics have in establishing taste and yeah. highlighting interesting things? Well. This is an interesting question, and, and let me lead into it by saying I just realized something recently, right? So, um, when, I, when I got into making games, right, it's because I was very interested in games, and like I liked thinking about them, and I liked thinking about this is what this, is what this game does that's smart, and this is what it does that's not smart, and like all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's how most game designers get into design, right? They're thinking about what, how is this game made, and what does it do? And that's really what critics do also, at least when they're really being critics yeah. and not just being like, I had fun, 9 out of 10 or whatever. When they're telling you what was interesting about the game, they're, they're doing that same thought, right? And so, <clears throat> in some way that is hard to articulate, I didn't think of myself as uh, being substantially different from a game critic. Until at some point I release this game that's like a lot of people are playing and, and you know, Braid, my last game, um, and I start talking about game criticism in the way that I always used to, but now suddenly there's a line there because it's like, oh, you're a developer and now you're saying things about, you're criticizing criticism, so you're pointing fingers at another party and it's like, well, actually, I kind of always was a game critic, I just wasn't like a famous blogger or something, right? So, so when I, so I still have this tendency to think about criticism and care about it and want it to be good, just the way that I want games to be good. Mm -hmm. And it comes across as me pointing a finger at another party, but I don't, I don't feel that way because I feel like a game critic, right? Okay. Um, which is, I, I don't know how much sense that makes, but I, I just realized like the other week that like that's a thing, and it's like, oh, yeah. Um, so when it comes to game criticism, we're at a really odd time because some games are really interesting, right? And, and have a lot that you could say about them. And some are really not that interesting, right? Like some, some games, you know, you can look at the front of the box and you know exactly everything about that game. Um, and yet, you know, and, and we still, you know, this has been beaten to death among critics discussing this among each other, but <clears throat> there's different roles. There's like someone who's really trying to be a thinker about games and what they're doing, and there's somebody who's just like trying to tell people, uh, should you be spending $50 or $60 on this thing? Yeah, you know, the criticism versus the buyer's guy. Yeah, and those are very different roles, actually, yep. and there isn't, and I think, I think everybody realizes that, but I that still doesn't end up congealing very well on the internet somehow. Like, there's still always a lot of a mix between those two things. Um, so, so when I go on Twitter and I say, like, you know, why are these games critically acclaimed or whatever, kind of what I'm talking about is, is that side of it that's trying, to, not really being the product buyer guide and, and, and more like the doing advanced thinking about games. I'm like, why, why are people who are sort of advanced thinkers being so uncritical about these absurdities in, in these things? Um, and then people come back at me and say like, oh, how are, who are you to criticize that, that players want to play this game? And it's like, well, I'm not really. I mean, if you want to play that game, great. Go play that game. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you want to just sit down and be entertained and whatever, cool. But um, yeah, that's that sort of... I don't know. I mean, 
Well, it seems, I mean, just... There's really no way around this. Like, any time you criticize <laughs> anything, people on the internet yeah. are going to criticize you in return, so... Well, it seems it is like what, it is. what you are getting at, um, ultimately, and what, and I, and I notice is, is, is how a lot of people talk about games, is if it's fun, mm. it is therefore great. Uh, and there's not much separation between what I personally like, what I personally enjoy, what I personally find fun, versus what is actually interesting and smart and progressive. Yeah, well, and there's a large degree of personal taste in there, oh, yeah. too, right? So, um, part of this might come down to me being older now, like I'm over 40, right? So I've played a lot of games. Yeah. And after you play a certain number of games, um, and I don't know how much of this is me being over 40 versus games have been around a long time also and there's a there's a much longer history of games like when i was in college we were had 20 years less of history of games yeah. right so there were fewer patterns established because games are young right um but but the upshot of all that is a lot of games i play now and they're not really doing anything that games i played 20 years ago weren't doing except maybe cosmetically and and maybe, yeah, the game design's a little smoother, the, you know, t technology is much better and all that stuff. But just in terms of when you sit down as a player and the feelings you're having and the, the way you're trying to get things done, the mode in which you're interacting with the game, it's not really different. And after decades of that, you sort of say as a person, I kind of want something else than this thing, right? It's, I've, I've done a bunch of that, it was fun, um, but how many more hours of my life am I gonna spend on what is essentially that same activity, right? So for me now, the things that are progressive and thought-provoking and like challenging, not in a difficulty reflex challenge, but like challenging me as a person, those are actually what I think is like fun, right? And playing a first-person shooter where there's some guys in a shooting gallery and stuff, is not very fun, even though it might have been much more fun, you know, when I was yeah. 17 and hadn't played that many games, right? And so I think that's also, you know, when, when a Twitter storm kind of starts and some of the people participating in that discussion are like 17 and, and haven't played, you know, 40 years worth of games and, um, and they just don't have the same perspective and they're like, how can you say that that's not fun? But those same people, 24 years from now, might very well yeah. see that perspective, right? Well, I, I guess to compare it to the movie industry, it seems mm. like if you look at if you look at action movies today, you look at action movies 20 years ago uh, and 30 years ago, the, the biggest difference is their CG. Um, there yeah. isn't a huge way in which the story unfolds and the action unfolds and all this other stuff. It's just kind of a technical thing. And a lot of games try to capitalize, jump on the entertainment aspects, um, and they're basically just action movies in game form. So I guess that that's why, if I had to guess, you'd almost see stagnation in certain elements, because what's fun is fun, and is always going to be fun um, to a large segment of people. Um, yeah, I mean, drawing analogies with Hollywood is hard. Yeah, um, it is. But it's, it's also appropriate, though. I mean, there's this interesting thing going on with movies, where you, you look at most of what is made, and it's not movies that are trying to be serious, right? It's, yeah. it's like a, a blockbuster action movie where it's two-thirds CG, or it's like a comedy that's not trying to be a deep comedy, or whatever, yeah. right? It's entertainment. That's movies. most of the output of Hollywood, but we still take movies seriously, yeah. culturally, much more than games, right? And I think it's because occasionally there are movies that don't do that, and, and because of that, movies like have this anchor, and, and maybe because that anchor's been around a long time, and people grew up with it, movies are disrespected. And so maybe games can get there, but only if there's enough developers trying to make these kind of anchor games, you know? So, you know, most movies that come out and you see an ad for it or whatever, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not that interested in that movie, but, but there's certain directors, you know, if, if Darren Aronofsky has a new movie coming, or David Lynch has a new movie coming, I'm automatically interested, right? Because those are people who are doing things that, that speak to me as a person, and very often I'll walk away from their movies with a lot new to think about and engage with, and I don't feel like we're there with, with games yet. Like, we don't know how to... So, 
So this is true despite that fact that you said that that there is a parallel between games and movies about doing superficial things like like you know an action movie now has much higher technology to work with but it's not really doing anything that different yeah. from an action movie a few decades ago right well, I, don't know. I feel like Sometime in the 80s is where things got I was set actually going to, yeah, now. like yeah. the Indiana Jones. In yeah, like, like, like 70s like has, to 80s is really different, but yeah. from 80s until now is yeah. like pretty much the same. Um, and, and games has a similar thing going on. And in fact, in games, we have way more technology proportionally. Um, but somehow that ability to mine a story and tell it visually in movies, there's enough there that you don't need to rely on the technological progress to get people interested, mm -hmm. right? You can show a movie that isn't full of CG or whatever that a lot of people will want to go see. And I don't really feel like that's the case with games yet. And maybe it's just a matter of time. Yeah. I don't know. So it's also, I mean, going back to the role of the critic and the role of the industry itself, I mean, most movies are, are dumb entertainment and really enjoyable and fun. Uh, and everybody knows about Transformers, everybody knows about these movies. But everybody also knows about Zero Dark Thirty because it's nominated for Best Picture and because, you know, and, and, and Golden Globes and, and the industry itself and the critics are pushing it as like, you really got to see this. This is a really difficult movie to watch and, it's, and it shows um, movie as art, basically. Yeah. But the game industry doesn't have that as much because the games that are pushed are also the games that sell often. Um, yeah. So I was just wondering what you thought about the role of Critic, and also, I think last year we made serious strides in this as an industry, because we pushed Journey and The Walking Dead, which are not nearly as flashy, but they are, they're more thoughtful. Um, and we pushed them to the forefront, and we pushed Hotline Miami to the forefront, and we said, you know, these, these are games that we're going to celebrate. Um, flaws, some, they are flawed in some ways, but they are still different and unique and kind of pushing things forward. So it's, yeah. like, where do you think the Critic's role is, and do you think we're moving in the right direction? Well, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe we're starting to, to have that. I mean, a lot of people are paying attention to Journey among critics and among developers. So, you know, the GDC announced their nominees recently for the Game Developers Choice Awards, and yeah. Journey is in, like, most categories, right? So a, a lot of people like it. Um, at the same time, is not it doesn't feel quite the same as what we have in movies. Like, proportionally... Zero Dark Thirty probably gets more attention in film than like Journey gets in games. I think. I don't know. Maybe. Well, Journey Maybe. is almost an aberration because it got Game of the Year from, from GameSpot and IGN and other huge places. And it, se yeah. it seems like it really, and even like well, the GAF Game of the Year thread as far as like yeah. people who play games really like that. But that might be an, like a Well, may difference. maybe we're at a place where that's starting to change. I don't know. Um, it's, it's going to be interesting to see. Like, I I'd certainly feel like we're not, we're not at a stopping point right now. We're in the middle of attitudes changing. Yeah. And so I'm hopeful that stuff like that ha and, and I don't, And I don't mean that I'm hopeful for necessarily independent games to get attention. Like, I don't really care if a game is made by two people or if it's made by, like, 200 people. But I, I just want them to be interesting, mm -hmm. you know? Well, and... I um, and I think that there's a pressure that gets exerted that way. So if, if two people go off and make something that's really interesting, you know, large teams look at that and they're able to mine at least a little bit out of that and say, oh, that thing that they did was works. Yeah. And people were interested and bought it, so let's do that in our $100 million budget game as well, right? Um, so I hope that more of that happens. I don't know who can, I can't claim to predict the future. So, yeah. Uh, if that happens, though, it'll be nice. Like, once in a while, I get pessimistic. And, you know, among developers, we have this conversation about our games sort of becoming like movies where people kind of take them seriously. Or are they going like comic books where you can sort of say, yeah, there's one or two comic books that are interesting. Like, one of them even won a Pulitzer Prize. But, yeah. but as a whole, you don't... If you're a random member of society and you want to go see something that's like meaningful to you, and I'm not going to try to define meaningful, I'm yeah. just going to say everybody has their own definition, but if you want to go see something that's meaningful to you, way more people would go to a movie 
theater to do that than would go to a comic book store, yep. right? Almost nobody would think to go to a comic book store for that, even though if you're really into comics, you know that there's some interesting things there. So the question is, does games kind of become comics, or does it come, become movies, or does it become something better than movies? And the vote's not in yet on that. Um, I used to think that we were doomed to be comic books. Um, sometimes I still think that. During this discussion, I'm not so sure. Now I'm like, oh, maybe things are looking up. Uh, it, it really depends. Yeah. Well, I guess it's like how the big question is, because when, when people don't play games and they talk about games, they talk about you know, the big blockbuster games. They're maybe really violent, or they talk about um, Nintendo made games because they're popular, or they talk about Angry Birds uh, because that's also really popular. But like, not necessarily meaningful, deep stuff. They talk about it as a fun pastime or maybe a violent pastime, but they don't, they don't really look at the journey games, they don't look at spec ops, they don't look at like, games that are really doing something. So I guess it's like, how do we make that stuff what they recognize? Like, it's not like they're ever going to ignore the dumb stuff, but how do they recognize that? Because everybody knows Zero Dark 30, everybody knows this movie even if they haven't seen it, but not everybody, like I'm guessing Fox News doesn't know about Journey. So how does, how do gaming even get to that point? I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's challenging, right? But I can't... You know, part of it is just... I don't know. Like, like there is something there about whether normal people out in the world can just engage with the form in, in a natural way, right? So. So if your mom walks into a video rental store, she can probably find some things that she would want to watch and it's not that hard and, and she can have a worthwhile experience there. If she walks into like a video game store, it's probably a lot harder, right? Yeah. If she goes on her iPad, it's probably easier to find some things to play. But those games are really like, if you get something for 99 cents or free on on an iOS device is not trying to be that same kind of experience. Even if you go into a game store, right, mm -hmm. and you buy a $60 game, even if it's emulating an action movie, right, it's still got something where it's trying to give you an experience that's like really has a magnitude, right, yeah. and has a strength to it. And that's not the way that iPad games are usually. A yeah. very, very small, negligible percentage of them are that. Most of them are just like, oh, collect the coins for, you know, yeah. stuff that like gamer gamers would have gotten bored of in like 1983, right, um, is in vogue. And so, so part of that is sustained by the fact that people who are not into games do know how to interface with that and engage with it and get things out of it, right? Mm -hmm. But then is there, is there a route from there to experiences that are more than like jump around and collect the coins? Or is that where it bottoms out? You know? And I don't see a lot of developers on iOS trying to do more than, than the 99 cent collect the coins game or the free IAP, you know, buy time shortcuts all the time or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, there's a thing about those games. Like there's this whole trend toward IAP games that when I'm optimistic, I don't think is going to last very long. In the same way, like, you know, if you rewind to like two years ago, everyone was like, maybe it was more, longer than that now, because we just said our interview was two years ago. Uh, <laughs> you know, everyone was like, oh my God, Facebook games, that's the entire future. Like, wow. You know, that seems like forever ago. But, but that was totally a thing, yeah. right? And now it's like, okay, Facebook games is something that exists, yeah. but it's really not. You wouldn't say that that's the future of games no. with a straight face. Because it bottomed out really early. Like there were, these, there were these very cynical design methods that were being employed that were just about getting you to spam your friends. It like burned really fast like a wildfire and then everything was burned out and people were like, you know what? I'm really not that interested in playing Facebook games, right? This, this big audience that people thought they were gonna reach decided that these games were not really worth their time, as near as I can tell. And Facebook also like changed yeah. how spammy they were, but, but I think even if they were still spammy, what would have happened is people would have stopped paying so much attention to Facebook because Facebook's spamming them all the time yeah. with things that they don't care about, right? 
And I think something like that is in the midst of happening right now with free IAP games. Where, so I, I think there's such a thing as a good game that's free, where you have in-app purchases that are respectful to the player and that aren't like pay to win and that let you as a player exercise choice about how much you want to get engaged with this game. That is, however, not 99.9% .9 of what's getting made right now. Um, very few games even see that as a problem and, and try to go there. And so I feel like we're going to have the same wildfire thing where this stuff burns. It's going to be burn longer than Facebook games, but at some point it'll burn itself out unless we just get more interesting yeah. there. And it's an interesting question as a designer about how do I take all this stuff that we know is interesting about games, that we've spent decades making games that, that have these really interesting interactive things in them and these ideas, and then how do we strip away all the trappings so that you don't have to have played first-person shooters for 10 years to have this experience? Like, how do you, how do you, you know, let someone who is walking into the video store for the first time have that experience and see what's really good about games, right? Yeah. Um, and when we can do that, then I think we get more cultural acceptance. But that's not very easy. Um, no. And people have to work at it. Yes. Uh, so I guess um, talking about more like how games are presented, um, one of the most disappointing things recently for me is, is Bioshock Infinite is coming out. Uh, and I, I loved the original Bioshock. And Bioshock Infinite is exploring xenophobia and like fear of the other and how a society cannot live if you don't accept everybody. And it sounds fascinating to me. I don't know anything else about the game other than that. <laughs> but if you look at the marketing material, it's being pitched as uh, a, an exciting action game, basically. Yeah. So, I mean, how do you feel about this disconnect between like marketing and message of games? You know, I understand that, and I, I don't have that much of a problem with it. I mean, I wouldn't do it that way. But you know, there was this whole uproar with like the Bioshock Infinite cover with yeah. the dude with the shotgun slung over his shoulder, right? Um, on the one hand. I see why people are a little bit worried about that, like, oh, they're going to take all the interesting things out of Bioshock or whatever. I don't suspect that's going to happen. I, I don't know anything about well, the game. I, don't, you I, know, don't, I, I haven't played a pre-release of yeah, it or anything. I don't, I don't so think I don't people know. are scared the game is going to change. I think but, it, but they're mad at the presentation. Yeah, and, and it's, at least I can speak hmm. personally for me. Um, I think it's really scary that they are making something smart. Uh, if Bioshock is any indication, really smart, really thoughtful, and really powerful, and they're scared to present that because games are not that. It's not scared though, right? It's a it's a market reality. Like when you spend a lot of money on a game, you kind of have to make that back. So so if we want more of these smart games to be made, you have to demonstrate that they're financially feasible, right? That it's not oh, we made something that wasn't just a first-person shooter, and so nobody bought it, right? Mm -hmm. and there's a little bit of precedent in that direction already, and you want to not feed that, right? So, so you, want, you want the opposite thing, right? You want like, oh, this is a first-person shooter, which we know people are interested in, but it had this extra thing that made it interesting to more people, right? And so I probably wouldn't do it the way they're doing it, but I, I totally understand why they're doing that. And I, don't necessarily have a problem with it. Okay. I look forward to a future where we don't have to do that. Hmm. But at the same time, like, you know, look at movie posters. Go around town someday, look at movie posters, and count the percentage of them that do not have a gun in the poster. <laughs> it is pretty small. You know, even for things that are like serious dramas or whatever, there's a dude with a gun in the yeah. poster. And it's because that's a market reality. And I don't, I don't like that. And again, I probably would not... If I were a filmmaker, I would not want... I would have a clause in my contract <laughs> with the studio. There's no gun in the poster. <clears throat> but, but it really, um, really... Yeah. So, however... So now let me get all trademark controversial and have a bunch of people on the internet pissed off at me, right? <clears throat> let me take the first Bioshock as a guide because I don't really know that much about it. Yeah. Right? Right. Nobody does, I don't think. Um, so the first Bioshock, you could on the one hand say, well, it's, it's doing all these things that are smart. You have like these interesting twists, and you have a setting that's like more imaginative and thoughtful than what a lot of people do and all that. And that's all true. Yeah. And relative to the background of most games being produced, 
it stands out in that way, okay? But you can't go up to like a reasonably well-educated person who's a random sample of society and give them Bioshock as a deep and meaningful work. Because when you go play it, what you're actually doing 95% of the time is shooting guys in the face. And then like 5% of the time, the other stuff comes in, That's right? True. Um, and that doesn't, like, Catcher in the Rye has like 0% shooting guys in the <laughs> face, right? And so that's kind of what I'm saying is that, and that ties into a little bit into, into my Twitter rant from earlier, is just that if Catcher in the Rye is a really interesting story, something like, I don't want to single out Bioshock, but games like that, that, that are a, a, like a, um, have a baseline of like a first person shooter or something, and then have some story bits that are interesting, they don't live up to the same standard. They simply don't, because you're shooting guys in the face all the time. And that has an impact on the story. And the, we have a problem as designers in that we've trained people to expect to shoot hundreds of guys in the face. And you can't, you can't do, so, okay, so let me, let me switch away from Bioshock to another game that I, I really enjoyed, Red Dead Redemption. Okay. I had a lot of fun with it. I thought, I was very glad that they made it. And I'm glad they tried to do some emotional things or some poignant things. But the ending to that game was totally absurd, okay? <laughs> because, they have this long plot where for 20, hour, 20 hours you're trying to work your way up and, and you know, get to the right position as this character and because it's in the realm of an open world shooter it involves shooting a lot of guys and it, the stat screen tells you how many guys yeah. you've shot. I think I shot 860 guys. <laughs> Imagine a movie that's trying to be a serious drama, just picture that. A serious drama where the main character shoots 860 guys and then goes home to his family at the end and you try to have this touching moment where he's caring for his family. It simply doesn't work because you've changed the value of human life, right? Like part of that shooting 860 guys was like burning down a village of poor peasants so that you could like get in with the Mexican army, right? and like throwing Molotov cocktails into their house and stuff, which like, those are families just like your family that they're trying to have this poignant moment with at the end, right? So I think <clears throat> that poignant moment thing is good. Mm -hmm. It does not work in that kind of a game. It simply doesn't. And so, <clears throat> you know, when we come along as game critics and say, whoa, this is amazing, right? I, I don't remember if people said that about Red Dead Redemption. Yeah, they probably did. did. Yeah. I don't know. When we say that, it only makes sense to people who are immersed in this bubble of video games and surrounded by games that don't even have that at all and where you're just shooting guys in the face, right? But then if you turn around and like say, say you met somebody who's like been a monk or something, right? And they live in the monastery and they read books and you show them Red Dead Redemption and say this is a really meaningful game, they're not going to see it that way, right? So I think that's the most valuable thing that, that game developers can have and that critics can also have is the ability to step outside this bubble and see games from outside the bubble, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's useful to be in that bubble and un be immersed oh, in yeah. the history of games and understand it because otherwise you're uninformed, right? But you need to be able to step back and forth across the border and evaluate things as a human being who doesn't you know, play first-person shooters all the time. Yeah. I think that's very useful. Yeah, I guess I when, when, when you talk about um, shooting guys in the head as a crotch of game design, um, one of the reasons that I thought Spec Ops was so powerful is that it actually used that shooting people in the head as part of its storytelling. And the game doesn't work without that extreme violence and the extreme repetition of killing a thousand dudes. Because uh, I don't know if you played it, but it ties into basically like... I, I have played it. I did not play it far enough for that to pay off. Okay. If it does, I'm yeah. skeptical that it does because yeah. again, I'm skeptical of statements like that. Yeah, well, it's, it's I, I played it far enough to be like, 
this is absurd that I'm shooting a thousand dudes. Yes. I mean, it's even more shooting gallery-ish than many games. It is, you know? yeah. I guess it's, it's, it's kind of patterned after a game like Gears of War, right? It is, ex yes. But in Gears, the enemies are like aliens yeah. that soak up a huge amount of damage, this right? Is, Whereas in Spec cool. Ops, it's like three or four humans yeah. for every one alien in Gears or something, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, mean, I guess um, the point of that game ultimately is kind of looking at the power fantasy of modern military games and how ridiculous that is. Um, okay, I didn't have to play all the way through the that to happen. But yeah, that so. was one of the times where the gameplay and the message actually went together, which was nice. Um, and I guess, like, if you look at it, uh, another example, and I haven't played it yet, but Tomb Raider looks like it's uh, the storytelling is all about survival, and um, the gameplay is all about murder. Um, and it's like, how important do you think it is to have narrative and gameplay mesh? Well. I think it's very important. Well, okay, if you're going to have narrative, or if you're going to have gameplay, right? You can sort of do a game that's like all narrative, and you're just yeah. picking choices or something, and that's still kind of gameplay, but but minimal, right? Yeah. Um, or you can have obviously have a game that's like very minimal narrative, right? Yeah. Um, and those things are easier. Either <laughs> yeah. of those extremes is easier because they don't fight with each other. But as soon as you start doing both then it takes great care to make a work that is intact, right? Um, and that's a disadvantage that we have if we're trying to do story. Like, a novelist doesn't have to worry about gameplay, so he yeah. can focus on telling the story in the deepest, strongest way that he can. Um, for me, personally, it is very, very hard to take a story in a game seriously if it clashes with what's happening during the gameplay because in some sense I feel like the gameplay is uh, whatever the gameplay message is overrides the story in some way it's sort of it's sort of like someone being hypocritical and like they'll tell you you should you should love everybody and not lie and and then they turn around and you see them lie to people and like steal from their friend, right? It's like, well, you're saying these things, but then you're doing the opposite, right? Yeah. And you don't think very well of that person probably, right? It's just like you'd have more respect for them if they just wouldn't say the stuff and just do what they're going to do, then at least they're just being straightforward, right? Um, and I feel like most games that try to have big stories are like that to some degree or another. Like they're saying something at best, the activities in the game don't have much to do with what they're saying, and at worst, they like directly contradict. You know? And we keep doing that as an industry for some reason, I think just because, in part because game developers don't care enough, but in part that's also because games are just really hard to make and there's a lot of momentum and while people can be successful doing the current thing, there's like no reason to change, right? So, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, well it goes back to selling also, like Bioshock looks great and like you needed a budget to make Bioshock and if yeah. you're making a budget you have to sell and if you're gonna sell you have to make it fun. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of what it falls back on, so it's like, Heavy Rain is, is one of the few examples I can think of a game with a budget that's it's not fun. Um, it doesn't try to be fun, it's, it's trying to be engaging in other ways. But that, that is a, an exception because that is what our medium is, is, is entertainment first and foremost. So that's why it seems like there's an inherent clashing between message and Yeah, messaging. well I don't, it's interesting, like sometimes I wonder how much I belong in the current video game industry because I don't think of my games as entertainment at all. I mean. Unless you have a very broad definition of entertainment, right? If, if, if entertainment means something that's not necessary for survival that you enjoy, then, then I guess that's true, because I want people to enjoy my games probably, but, but they're not about delivering enjoyment in a little tube, you know, into the player's <laughs> arm, right? They're about... Um, they're about raising ideas and, and challenging the player a little bit and showing the player things that, the play, that they wouldn't have seen without this game, right? Which is sort of like when I go see a movie or read a book, that's what I want from those, right? I don't very often go to things 
uh, you know, books or movies with the intention, I'm just going to mindlessly bliss out for a couple hours at this thing and it's not going to impact my life in any way. It's just not my personality. Yeah. I think some people do that and that's totally fine. We're just different people. But, but then when I go make things, I'm trying to make things that are like what I personally want to interact with out in the world. And that's not what most games are trying to do, I feel like. Some of them are. Most of them are not. And so I feel like kind of an odd person out very often. Yeah. It is what it is. So, I mean, what is it like to make video games? Uh, I mean, because that's, I mean, it's, it's both of our lives. I mean, you make them, I write about them. Yeah. When you see the way that other people outside of us think about what we're doing, basically, like, well, how, do, how does that feel to you? I don't know if I really know still. I mean, for all that stuff I just said about stepping outside the bubble and stuff, I feel like I have a certain degree of ability to do that. But I'm still someone who's grown up with video games and was excited about them since I was, you know, like six years old or whatever yeah. when I first played them, right? Um, so, so when you see someone in the news like, you know, Leland Yee saying, you know, video gamers need to quiet down yeah. or whatever, um, I don't quite feel like I know what his perspective is. I can sort of imagine, but I don't, I don't really know. Um, so that's, that's part of what's interesting, is just realizing that the world is big and most people in the world, even though games are more popular than they ever have been, right? Mm -hmm. and, and they're played by a more diverse range of people than they ever have been before, most people in the world are not interested in video games and don't think about them. So, isn't that kind of weird, right? That feels weird from where I'm sitting because it's what I think about all day, every day, all the time. Yep. I, I don't know what to do with that, right? It's just interesting. So when you like introduce yourself to someone for the first time and you're like, hey, uh, I make video games. Like what is it, and you know, they don't play video games. And then like what is, what is their reaction like and do you try to justify as like, no, I make, I like really smart games, or well, well that presumes work? that you talk to enough people to meet people on a regular <laughs> basis. I, I've been working way too hard lately for that. Um, but yeah, actually, usually I have to try to preface that introduction, right? Because if I go up to someone and say, "Oh, I make video games," it used to be that they're because I'm a game designer, and and my designs are all about. You know, when I design a game, I'm always thinking about what is the player's reaction to encountering this thing and, and how, do I, how do I set that up, right? A conversation with someone is a little bit the same way when you like pre-tailor things that you might commonly say, like here's what I do, right? Yeah. So I know if I say I make video games, for most people in the world, two or three things are the immediate reaction. One is like, oh, that stuff about shooting people in the face, I'm not that interested in that, right? Or two, like, oh, that's just nerdy stuff that I'm not interested in. Or three, um, uh, you know, that's those little piddling iOS or Facebook games that I'm not interested in, right? That's most people's exposure to video games. So um, usually I go really broad in a way that does not allow people to jump to conclusions until I've given them sufficient information. So I usually start by saying, well, you know, I, I run a small software company. Like, you don't even say games, <laughs> right? And then you start talking about, uh, you know, I do stuff in, in the form of video games, but that's, it's also um, something you could think about is like interactive art because we have a, we have a point, right? We have, a, we're trying to take these forms, you know, I might say something like, if you think about what a video game is, in its most basic form, um, it's a stuff appearing on a screen that's a result of some very intricate computations that pay attention to the input you're giving it, and then maybe simulate a world and give you a reaction, right? And that's a very broad template. You can do a lot with that. Um, and games sort of have fallen into a couple of uh, very specific avenues. 
but when you look at the potential of that form, you can drive it to a lot of places, and that's part of what I try to do is drive it to new places, right? And you can bring up an analogy like, hey, if you think about comic books, what comes to mind is superheroes, you know, punching each other really hard. Yeah. Um, there's nothing in the technology or the form of a comic book that's anything about superheroes, right? A comic book is like a panel with an illustration and maybe some talk bubbles and maybe some captions, right? And the panels change in size and there's nothing in that description <laughs> that has anything to do with a superhero, but somehow, because of historical reasons that are actually well documented now, that became the major thing and then now there's a cultural inertia that kind of keeps it there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I'm able to have interesting discussions with people about that without them jumping to conclusions. Um, and that I think is, is worth something because you at least get to get to maybe broaden their mind a little bit like, oh, maybe there's potential there. Maybe there's something interesting there and, and next time they hear the word video game, their brain doesn't shut off automatically. Um, but I don't know. Maybe it doesn't work. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. It's just I try to do that. You know? <laughs> uh, so like based on, on Braid, mm. which has mild violence, and what I know of The Witness, which seems to have no violence. Yeah, mild violence, for anyone watching this, by the way, is like jumping on the little yeah. monster's head and he falls off the screen. That is, the ESRB considers that mild violence. Yes. I mean, it's, it's Mario caliber violence. Yes. Um, but I mean violence in the way that like you have to physically dispose of, of enemies. Like that's, that's yeah, but they don't necessarily die. They just no, you just thing. dispose of them. Yes. Uh, and as far as I know, the witness doesn't have any violence. It does not. Um, is this like concerted choice for you? Like I don't want to have violence in my games. No, I mean I don't. So unlike many people in the in the world who are up in arms about video games. I'm not so sure that violence in games is such a bad thing. I, I don't really, I don't also think that it's good, but I think it could be used effectively, right? Just the same way, I wouldn't ever go and say, you know, we shouldn't be allowed to have violence in films, right? As yeah. soon as you say that, you're cutting out some of the great film experiences Definitely. that have been made, right? So obviously it's a mistake to do that. However, <laughs> I think the way that we're using violence in games right now is pretty stupid and actually um, almost always undermines that ability of violence to like make an impact, right? We desensitize people to it. And I'm not saying we desensitize them to real world violence because I don't know if that's true or not, but we definitely desensitize them to video game violence. That's just what happens after you yeah. shoot 800 guys in Red Dead Redemption, right? So. Um, And the other thing I think about it is that it's just not that interesting, right? Like, I don't, if, a, if the main point of a game is that you shoot guys for 10 hours, that's not a draw for me, right? I need, I need something else to happen, right? And then as soon as you need something else to happen, then maybe you find that the violence is getting in the way, right? Because like I said, you're having a, trying to have a serious story, but then the violence is making that story absurd or self-contradictory, right? So at some point, you kind of have to get the violence out of there to do something serious. Um, in The Witness, though, the lack of violence is not really because of that. It's, it's more straightforwardly just that I didn't want to have an action element, and violence is usually, at least to some degree, an action element, right? Um, a violent game that doesn't have action is like, would be really toward the disturbing end of the scale because like you're in control always. It's like you've got people tied up and you're like having violence on them, right? Yeah. This is... That would be a very disturbing game. Uh, this is not what the witness is. Um, <laughs> I wanted, so w when I made Braid, I was trying to design the puzzles so that um, they didn't require that much of a, like platformer skills, right? It's in the form of a platformer, but I wanted it to be that when you understand the answer to a puzzle, then you can pretty much execute and not, um, you know, not have to try yeah. stuff 50 times. For some players, that's kind of true, and for some, it's not. And it's just because, you know, how many platformers have you played, and how good are you at them, and, and all that. So I thought it would be interesting now to be able to focus uh, just on the puzzle ideas and really make it easy to execute 
And, and the way that I would do that is by uh, making the interactivity as simple and as straightforward as I could. And so there's also a focus on how do we keep the controls super simple and yet make the game very, very interesting. Like I don't like, one other con way that you make controls simple is like, you know, one touch like <laughs> to steer or to jump like in iPad games. I don't, I don't like that because it generally makes the game just too simple for me to really want to engage with. But, but if you go a little more complex than that, but still much simpler than like I'm using every button on the gamepad and all the triggers and all that, um, I think there's a sweet spot there where things can be really interesting. So that's what we're trying to do. OK. Yeah. Uh, so when you were making Braid, nobody knew who you were at that point? Yeah. Uh, well, some developers did, but nobody developers. out in the world yeah. did. Yeah. So it was almost like an expectation-free thing, and all of a sudden, you know, it's August 2008, uh, playing an Xbox Live, and it's like, wow, this is really, this is really good. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's going to be what five years maybe after that will be the witness, and now yes. everybody knows who you are, and you made you made well, Braid. Well, not everybody. Well, everybody who follows. I mean, you're you're a name in this industry now. Yes, um, yeah, I'm in a different position than I you was. You have a little Braid. expectations yeah. are actually. I think a lot of people, myself included, are looking forward to The Witness more so that you're making it more than what I've seen, since I haven't seen much with it. Yeah. And this is what you kind of have to fight against and, and you have in the back of your head all the time. Is It's got to be like, you have something to live up to now. Well, what I learned, so, so what I learned from releasing Braid is that I am a harsher critic of my own stuff than many people out there. I mean, there's people who just didn't like Braid and yeah. gave it lower ratings than I would give it, right, or whatever. But, <laughs> but often it's because they're just not that interested in that kind of game or whatever, and that's cool. It's like, yeah. all right, you know, I'm not, you don't expect a game that you make to be for everybody. Um, but a, a lot of the people who liked Braid, and, and I say this in Indie Game the Movie, and you know, um, a lot of the people who liked Braid didn't really like it for the same reasons that I liked it, or liked it for a subset of the reasons why I liked it. And there are some things that I worked really hard on in that game that are not very often noticed in, in reviews and stuff. They do get noticed, right? So it's not like the world is like completely <laughs> un, uncaring, but it's a minority, right? And so. Um, And, and there's sort of a choice that, that you have as a developer, right, when you're in this situation. It's like, okay, A, I could go and have my goal be, I'm going to make a game that gets a higher Metacritic than Braid. Um, but if you decide to do that, then you're not making anymore what you think is the most important thing. You're trying to game a system and get a high score. And that's a cynical activity, right? I would much rather, like I've been, I've been working really hard for most of this four years. Um, and that only is a good idea and a sustainable thing when it's not a cynical activity, when it's, I'm doing this because I really care about what I'm making, right? And the thing that I'm making is the best thing that I know how to make. And when I'm doing that, I know from this braid experience that my tastes are a little different than a lot of people's. So I may well end up making a game that I think is much better than braid that maybe in general people out there don't agree. Um, and I am still okay with that. Uh, it's, it's a really rewarding game. Um, I do, I do think it's much better than Braid. And the good news, though, is that the early playtesters who have played the game also think it's better. Like, they, say, they always say that. This is better than Braid. Right? Okay. Sometimes a lot better, which is <laughs> interesting, because Braid is such a critically acclaimed game. Um, and I do, I do have this challenge, right, where we have to somehow figure out how to talk about the game um, in a way that lets people understand that it's interesting in a context where it's really surprising that it, this could be an interesting game. Because, you know, we showed, we showed the game a really, really early version of it at PAX a couple of years. Yeah. Maybe it was PAX 2010. Um, I think so, August 2010. And um, 
nobody knew what it was back then. It wasn't labeled even, so you couldn't tell it was by the people who made radio. It was kind of stuffed in a corner of another booth. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, from that, some video got out on websites, and it's video of the first you know five minutes of the game, and it's like, oh, you're tracing a, a little line on some grids, and it's like, how is that interesting? <laughs> I, you know, and the answer is it's super interesting, um, and that's the amazing thing is that we found by going to this very constrained form we found things that are interesting in defiance of all expectations. And that's part of the magic when you play, is you keep going through this world and finding stuff that keeps revising kind of the idea of what's going on, and it's like, oh, this thing, and oh, that thing, and, and that's what's good, is all these lights that light up, you know, as you play. Um, but you can't show people those lights that light up, like in a trailer, so how do we do that? I don't, I don't know. Is this <laughs> going to be interesting? Um, but I really, I have no worries now about the quality of the game, unless we just like fumble the ball in the final execution, like making the modeling and texturing good and like making the voiceovers good, which is still, we have to put some work in there. And, um, but the actual gameplay, I have no problems with. It's, it's working and it's the, it's the, best thing I've ever worked on by far. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, there's a whole, you know, again, there's a whole team making the game. Yeah. And that is challenging sometimes even just from a, you know, let's move this truck in the, in the right direction. Yeah. But again, the, the positive thing is you can do things that you never could have done. Like Braid was a much smaller scale endeavor. Now that there's more people working on it, we can build something that's much more ambitious and, and interesting. Yeah. But it comes with its own challenges. So we'll see. We're in the final stretch. Okay. Um, yeah. I don't know. So uh, when Braid came out, you, you were kind of known for being maybe over attentive, uh, where you go to websites and you post comments and you kind of got like this, uh, this kind of image about you. Um, and then since the years have gone by, like you've still, you're still outspoken. And, and, and as yesterday proved on Twitter, like you, rub people the wrong way sometimes with your comments. And we've already seen yeah. uh, Phil Fish made a comment about how he didn't, he didn't really appreciate Japanese games. And he still has a backlash from that, regardless of how good Fez really was. Are you worried at all about being a public figure and letting, and letting more than just the game speak for itself, because you are also speaking for it? I don't usually like the public figure part, <laughs> as it turns out. Um, I mean, there's good parts of it, right? Like. It's, it's nice that if I have something I feel is important to say, that I can go and say it and, and maybe some people will listen now, or as that wouldn't have been possible like before the public. But, but honestly, it comes with a lot of negatives. And I'm not, um, I know people are gonna watch this and say, oh, he's being so disingenuous, and, but it's totally true. Like, especially being an internet related public figure, there's just a huge amount of grief that happens there. Um, and one thing that happens is there can be a sort of chilling effect. Like, so the thing that, that I said on Twitter yesterday, it was not even that, uh, it was not as inflammatory as things that I've said in the past. Um, it was really mild relatively, but it still got a bunch of people mad. Um, but I don't, like, at some point I reserve my right to remain to be a human being and to say what I'm honestly thinking and feeling. And, if people are gonna get mad about that, that's their choice. And I'm not doing it to make them mad. I'm just like, I'm, if we're having this big, if the point of the internet is to connect people <laughs> so we can share ideas and have this big discussion about what's going on, I have ideas and I'm gonna share them. And um, I, I am trying to even have a less confrontational style than I may have had in the past. <laughs> and maybe that's working, but, um, I don't, I don't want all the internet grief and negativity to have a chilling effect on my willingness to say things. So like one thing that happens, you know, I, I run a software company right now uh, that's small to medium size, right? And one thing that happens when people are in that position is they start thinking about the company and like, I want my company to be successful, right? 
and they go start getting media trained and uh, and then you ask a question and they say well <laughs> our next title uh, utilizes the most amazing properties of whatever console and you know etc right and you get that kind of non answer answer out of them all the time and you can tell right now that I'm not interacting with you as a media trained person and I think that's very valuable for my ability to express ideas but also just my ability to believe in myself as a human being and like not losing my soul in this process of becoming someone who more people are paying attention to so um, and I don't think you know I don't think we would be having this conversation right now if you felt that when I showed up I would be carefully auditing everything I say so as not to you know say anything non generic right and and so I don't ever want to go down that road and if if not going down that road means that I'm gonna annoy some people once in a while I'm okay with that because it is kind of their choice to be annoyed sorry people. <laughs> uh, I don't know yeah I mean this is something that my thoughts are still evolving on from day to day Okay, I don't know. I do think though that people don't realize like like there's all these gamers on the internet um, you know uh, someone will post something I mean there's this snowball that happens where like people will take things out of context and blow them up in a report and then gamers will comment and then someone else will cut something from the comment thread and make their own news article about a comment in the comment yes. thread and and then and this big shitstorm can happen right um, and that's why the the higher up people are the more media trained they are right so if you talk to like you know Peter Moore or like Phil Harrison or they're hundred percent on message all yes. the time <laughs> and it's not a very interesting interview ever those guys are smart and they have a lot of interesting things they could say and they choose not to say them right so and then who who loses in the end due to that well it's sort of the audience of those interviews yep. who could be hearing these interesting things and so whatever if I can counteract that process even a little bit like I'm not a high up figure at Microsoft or Sony or something so I don't I'm not of that level of public interest but what little amount that I have I'm gonna try to use in a way to keep the conversation rich and interesting okay we'll see okay uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just ask you one more question here. all right uh, so what you've been working on hmm. on the witness for four years yeah uh, roughly. and and you recognize problems in this industry and you recognize some things get a claim that shouldn't and all this other stuff so the witness comes out what what kind of impact do you want this to have I don't even know anymore I mean it's so so this is part of the braid thing with braid I kind of knew what kind of impact I wanted it to have which is why I was so attentive to the reception of the game for several months in a way that was sort of showcased in indie game the movie and stuff which I'm a little bit like oh, did they have to do that <laughs> um, but it was a really interesting situation where I'd worked really hard on a game for three and a half years and the game definitely lives as its own thing but there was this meta idea around it that was like look a game can be an artful thing that you spend years trying to meticulously craft and that can maybe stand on its own the, alongside artworks in other media and it's time for us to take this seriously right that was part of what I was thinking in my head and that's not the point of the game really because like I said it's its own thing but that's part of why I was doing it mm -hmm. and so then you come and you release the game and you start reading a lot of like product reviews and you're like oh my god people are not getting it I I and, and to put some more context behind this just imagine that you worked for three and a half years and now it's like the couple of launch months and you're like I, I want people to notice this and it's maybe not happening and I'm worried that this three and a half years is maybe gonna kind of go to waste and so that's it turns out that was totally unfounded like people actually do notice what's interesting about the game and I didn't have to worry but it was a little bit of that like mm -hmm. if you look at the like you watch something like indie game the movie and I wasn't panicked at that time because I had shipped my game but you look at all the developers who are in the middle of all that stuff yes. and they're just like really frazzled right so imagine that and it's like the game is going out in the world and you're like oh my god 
it didn't, it didn't work or, or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's what was going on there. The attitude toward games is different now, right? Um, now people have that idea, at least enough people have that idea that games could be taken seriously in that way. And I'm not saying that Braid itself succeeded or failed or anything, right? I'm not making that claim. I'm just saying there's been enough games between 2008 and now, and enough of them have succeeded enough that among game enthusiasts, we both know that, that or some people feel like games could be taken seriously that way. And then there's also more of a general acceptance of games made by smaller groups, right? Mm -hmm. If you rewind to like 06, 07, when I was making grade, that wasn't really a thing. Like, you had to, like a, a game made by a small team was usually like a casual game that was like matching gems, yeah. but on the, on the web or whatever, right? That was most of it. Or a hidden object game, I think, was starting to be a thing. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> I might make a hidden object game someday. It'd be, it'd be awesome. <laughs> uh, I have some ideas on how to do it. Uh, but, um, so anyway, with The Witness now, that doesn't need to be done. Like that, there's nothing I can do there aside from, to, to add to that idea or add to that discussion, aside from just try to make the best thing I can and put it out there. And again, it's not, um, I don't want to speak for the whole team, but I feel like probably most people on the team feel the same way. We're all just trying to make the best thing that we can. Okay. Um, and we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how people receive it. I think it's going to be doing very well. I mean, one of my friends who was an early playtester was like, oh my god, this game's going to sell billions of copies, right? I don't, I, I can't, it's hard for me always to believe that in advance. Um, I would be happy to believe that. So we'll see. Okay. We'll see if that happens. Okay.